Hello to everybody. We are now starting our last uh, panel uh, of this conference, uh, uh, which, uh, which is uh, the title of the panel is Art of Revolution 3. It's like a part of the overarching stream of panels. Uh, communism, love, comradeship. And here I think about, uh, so after these difficult debates we had, now we finally can enter the realm of not so heavy, more relaxed uh, uh, topics. Uh, yeah? uh, common, nice thing, we are not bloody Bolsheviks. You know, this is a trick. We also love comedy, we, we love and comradeship is not alien to us. And Lenin always said that revolution has a festive element in it, so I think this element will be somehow picked up in this uh, conversation. So we are uh, starting uh, uh, later, but we will, I think we can have half an hour more time for this panel. So first speaker is Aaron Schuster, University of Amsterdam. I think you can introduce his title of his presentation himself. Yeah, I think a good... Can I just speak, or do you need the microphone? <laughs> really? <laughs> So it won't be long now, comrades. This could be a good title for the paper. No. Too loud. Yeah, it was too loud. Use the mic. Just don't yell. Okay, so my talk's not going to be so theoretically dense, um, but I want to just talk about some of my recent obsessions. So referring back to Gigi and Lorenzo's uh, intervention before. So my recent obsessions relating to the October Revolution, and that has to do with Ernst Lubitsch, and Alexandra Kolontai. <coughs> and I also want to show, hopefully, the actuality of the revolution in these two, through these two authors. So, come closer, Kathy. So, Ernst Lubitsch was a German Jewish filmmaker who immigrated to the US in 1922, and he remained there until his death in 47. And he directed some of the greatest comedies, simply some of the greatest comedies that were ever made. So Preston Sturges, Billy Wilder are very much in the line of Ernst Lubitsch. Lubitsch comedies, they're known for their witty scripts, for their visual inventiveness and their style, the so-called Lubitsch touch. But many of the films are also deeply political, with very sophisticated, nuanced analyses of political situations, and how individuals are placed in these situations and how they can react to them. So there's actually kind of a great trio of political films in Lubitsch's oeuvre uh, that deal with sort of the great economic crisis of the 20th century, the Great Depression, and the two sort of responses to the economic crisis of capitalism, namely fascism and communism. So this trio of films are uh, Trouble in Paradise from 1932, which deals with the Great Depression, Ninochka, which I'll be speaking about today, from 1939, and To Be or Not to Be, dealing with fascism, Nazism, 1942. It's quite incredible that he actually made a comedy about Nazism in the middle of the war and at the kind of darkest moment of the war. Okay, just to give a quick example of the kind of political analysis that Lubitsch is able to give in his films, I have a very quick so, clip from this is actually from Trouble in Paradise, and I've made a montage of every line of dialogue, so every scene where they use this line, in times like these. In times like these, something is necessary. This is a kind of ideological formulation par excellence, as if our times dictated what was necessary, or a necessary form of action. And the way that Lubitsch transforms this line is really ingenious, and I think an excellent example of ideological criticism. So let me just play the scene. It's only about a minute. I am sure that if God had put him alive, the first thing he would do in times like these, cut shadows. Any woman who spent a fortune in times like this for a handbag, fool, fool, that fool. In times like these, everything is uncertain. Every conservative person should have a substantial part of his fortune within our reach. Speaking for the Lord of Directors as well as for myself, if you mean sin, in time like means I'm cutting the feet of the board of directors, then we resign. But in time like these, when we're doing cash business, why take a chance with your name? How did you sell? Three hundred francs. Well, in time like these, most people are cutting salaries. But if you're engaged to both of these ladies, three hundred and fifty? Okay, 
right? Mm -hmm. What I think is so interesting about this is also how ideological critique has to engage with the everyday ways of speaking. And I think a good contemporary example of this, I actually think one of the best films about the financial crisis was um, Steven Soderbergh's The Girlfriend Experience. Um, it reminds me, there's a, there's a great work of anthropology by Nancy Rees, an American anthropologist who was studying basically how Russians were speaking, like everyday forms of speech in Russia during the turbulent 90s and the perestroika era. And uh, it's just titled Russian Talk. And her thesis was the most common form of speech, the kind, the kind of basic zero level of speech for Russians was the complaint or the litany. And I think somehow the girlfriend experience could also be retitled American Talk. And it shows that the zero level of speech of Americans is self-promotion or hustling, mm. something like that. But what's interesting is the kind of sociological analysis of simply the everyday mode, how ideology penetrates into our everyday way of just speaking. Okay. On to Ninochka. So I really highly recommend this film, so in the context of a kind of celebration and reflection on the centennial of the October Revolution. And in fact, I think this is what Lubitsch was doing already in 1939. So this film illustrates a kind of attachment or fidelity to or an obsession with the revolution in spite of the horrors of state socialism. So Lubitsch was doing something very sophisticated, I think in the 30s, in his own ideological positioning with respect to the revolution. And it would be very easy to read this film as an anti-communist film. And in fact, this is how it was read all through the Cold War, especially in the 40s and 50s. This was known as a great anti-communist film, great piece of like American political propaganda. Um, you could read it, you could see it as a story of the East seduced by the West, um, of communism capitulating to capitalism, of a kind of die-hard Soviet agent falling in love with the luxury Parisian life and the charming aristocratic gigolo. So that's one way of understanding the film. Um, the fact that Garbo, Greta Garbo, laughs means that that kind of cold Russian exterior is finally cracked and she enters into the kind of effectively much warmer and more kind of sparkling Western world. So like if you, you know, if you scratch a Bolshevik deep down, you'll find a good capitalist subject, warm and loving and so forth and so on. Now, this is a very poor reading of the film, very poor reading of the film. And in a sense, it's, it, in its plot, it's precisely um, the opposite. I mean, that this kind of understanding of the relationship between East and West is precisely the, the object of Lubitsch's comedy. That's what he wants to treat when we say this kind of cliched narrative. So what's so remarkable, not only about this film, but about Lubitsch comedies in general, is that nobody is spared in them. So they're not satires where one person can feel superior because they're laughing at a so-called inferior object, but somehow nobody is spared in his comedies. So there's no safe position to take within them. Um, nobody is exempt from comedy's bite. So the capitalists are made fun of, the aristocrats are made fun of, the communists are made fun of. Everybody, in some sense, is the butt of a joke. And in fact, the most cutting, the best jokes and the most cutting jokes in the film are directed against capitalism, and they're directed against the aristocrats. So the aristocrats, for all their manners and sophistication, are portrayed in a totally unsympathetic light. And most remarkable of all, Ninochka, so the Soviet agent, she remains faithful to the revolutionary cause to the end. So she sacrifices, she's constantly sacrificing her own personal interests in favor of the people. And even though at the end she abandons state socialism, she does not abandon communism. So that's a very interesting kind of conclusion of the film. Um, it shows it's also kind of sophistication. So if there is a kind of conversion, if somebody does convert in the film, it's not so much Ninochka as the Count Leon Dalgu, so her lover, who fully falls you know, under Ninochka's spell, totally falls for her, and starts reading Karl Marx, and he even confronts his personal butler about the relations of exploitation, and he abandons the Duchess Swana, so he's a kept man, and she's basically supporting him financially. So he even abandons his like patron, as it were, um, who had been you know, funding his entire lifestyle. So that's the real conversion of the film. Okay, um, let me just go through very quickly the, the story of the plot. So it's the story of a Soviet special envoy, so comrade Ninochka Yakushova, She's sent by her superior, the Commissar Razinin, 
to oversee the sale of jewels in order to raise badly needed funds for the Soviet state. Okay, the jewels were formerly in the possession of a Grand Duchess, the Grand Duchess Swana, and they were confiscated during the revolution. Now their sale, the sale of these jewels is entrusted to this bumbling comic trio of Bulyanov, Ironov, and Kompalski, who become totally enamored with the high life in Paris, and they are eventually befriended and tricked by Count Leon Dalgu into delaying the sale. So he kind of sabotages the, the sale. Um, Leon himself is a kept man. He's the lover of the Grand Duchess Swana, who now resides in exile in Paris. And she learned about the presence of her jewels through an informer who works at this fancy hotel. Okay. Commissar Razinin is alarmed by the situation and he sends Ninochka to save the day. The trouble is that despite the fact she has this iron will and focus, she ends up falling in love with Leon. And the whole kind of middle section of the film, the largest part of the film is showing their, their, their romance. I would highlight just one moment, which is what this, this still shows. Is, I, th I think also kind of a brilliant comic moment is at one, at one time they go out drinking at like a fancy cafe. She's all dressed out, dressed nicely and so forth and so on. And uh, they get drunk. Now, in most screwball comedies, this would be the time in which some kind of a socially obscene thing happens or the sexual desire overflows, something like that. But instead, when she gets drunk, her spontaneous, authentic desire comes out and she starts preaching communism to everyone. <laughs> so here she's saying, oh, comrades, this refers to Julie. comrades, the good people of France. And she actually ends up going to the washroom and people start complaining that she's trying to organize the washroom attendance into some kind of new cadre. <laughs> so this is also interesting to see that when she gets drunk, her spontaneous, authentic desire is actually to spread communism. <laughs> now, what I want to show you, so the, the other clip I want to show you is actually the, mel the melancholy climax of this film. Um, it comes after their wild night. Basically, she's, been, she's so drunk, she's been playing with these crown jewels. Swana's agents has snuck into the, her hotel room and stolen the jewels. So she's lost control over the jewels. And Swana now comes to confront Ninochka and she makes this obscene proposition to her. So this is a little bit of a longer clip. What is you people all say about what you mean? I am delighted to have you here. I have reached a stage of civilization, therefore I'm trusting me. Leave, that's exactly what I think they want you to do. Leave. I don't mean this hotel, I don't mean Paris. I mean France. There's a plane in the Moscow, fly in the morning. Do you still think you're issuing all the Soviet powers in Petrograd? My powers in Petrograd. Yes, you took that away from me. You took away my Tsar, my country, my people. Everything I had. <coughs> but nothing more. People cannot be taken away, madam. My one of sixty million is now one. Now if you have their love, you haven't. That's why you're not in Russia any longer. And that's why you came here this morning. Problems were never solved by buying from a bakery. Oh, my dear, you don't know how impressive I could be. You don't see me in my regalia with my dad and all my jewels. You know that France is a 
high god, under the sovereign law of the Jewish prophet of state. France is going to uphold the ownership. <coughs> he says that France will uphold to every court, France. I will drag you to every court. Look at that. And when I say it will take two years, I am, as always, concerned. Won't those two years in court be expensive for you? I know that money was no longer because as long as you can squeeze it out of the pockets of the people, but now. I made a lot of money, but you have already run out of bed. Two years is a long time for your comrades to wait. I see. You've calculated the terms of hunger. No, I just want to be absolutely impartial. Both of us are faced with two rather uncomfortable years. We can condense those two years to two minutes, if you want to accept my proposition. Go on. I am willing to hand over the jewels and sign any necessary papers if you would take that 540 plane to Moscow. That's not the way to win him back. Not Leo. I think I know Leo quite as well as you. Perhaps a little better. Leave that word to me. Now, 540 leaves you time enough to close the deal with Monsieur Mercier. But uh, naturally, you'll be too busy for any farewells. Okay, so I just make it. I think we could give a longer reading of the scene, but just to give a very quick comment. I mean, one of the things fascinating here is it's clear that the aristocrat is being portrayed in a totally unsympathetic way, and the the humiliated Ninochka. So she, she humiliates her. She wakes up in the morning in this dress, hungover, etc. The humiliated Ninochka is the one who displays a true dignity and a real ethical position here. And there's a kind of double exchange going on. The money that's necessary so to feed the Soviet people, the jewels that really belong to the people and don't belong to one individual, but also the obscene exchange for the love of Leon. So all of this is being played out in this one scene. Now the result of this is that she returns to Moscow, so she gives up her love. She sacrifices her love for the people, which is her kind of constant theme throughout the film. So she, she's willing to, to make the, the sacrifice, as it were. So she's not simply seduced, let's say into another kind of life, but she remains faithful to her original political position. The result of it is she returns to Moscow, and she's later called in by this Commissar Razinin. Now, in one of the most, one of the greatest and most subtle jokes of the film, Razinin is played by Bela Lugosi <laughs> of Dracula fame. <laughs> The message is clear. Um, state socialism is a vampire. And the image of state socialism you know, is conflated with Dracula and vampirism. And it's also impossible here not to think of Marx's famous comment about capitalism as vampiric. The quote, famous quote from, uh, from Capital, from the first volume of Capital, uh, Capital is dead labor that vampire-like only lives by sucking living labor and lives the more and more, the more labor it sucks. Okay. One other comment is that Ninochka, in a, in a kind of uh, excellent, there's some kind of an excellent portrayal of the true academic melancholic position. So when Razinin wants to send her off for another mission, she begs him, just let me stay here and finish my work. I've concentrated everything on it. So once you've lost your love, and once you realize that the state socialism or the institution is somehow bankrupt, what does one have left? Leave me alone, let me work. Let me just do my work in peace. And the work itself should be some kind of promise, perhaps of a future redemption. If not that, at least I have something to cling on to. I would call this the kind of academic melancholic position that she falls into. <laughs> Okay, oh, okay. Actually, I want to play one. I'll have to shorten some things at the end. I play one more clip because I want to show now the seduction scene. So, this is going backwards the seduction scene between Leon and uh, Ninochka. This is a shorter clip, about a minute long. Thank you. Mm, keeping my money fit, keeping my mind alert, What's and keeping the land of peace, that's for my job. And what do you do for men's time? For men's Yes, sir. Not so much for men's <laughs> For a woman, my character is quite so clean. You are something you do not have in Russia. Thank you. That's why I believe in the future of my country. I'm here to live in Russia, as I met you. I still don't quite know what's all about. Confusing me. Frightens me. It fascinates me. Not. Like me, Your general appearance is not 
The whites of your eyes appear. Your cornea is excellent. Your body is terrific. You know what you're telling me? Your sweats were out Can it be that I'm falling in love with you? Why must you bring in wrong values? <laughs> Love is a romantic destination for most ordinary biological or, shall I say, chemical process. A lot of nonsense is talked and written about it. <laughs> Why, well, see, what do you usually say? I acknowledge the existence of a natural impulse common to all. What do I possibly do to encourage such an impulse in you? You don't have to do a thing. Chemically, but already quite sympathetic. <laughs> <laughs> You're the most incredible creature I've ever met. Yourself. <laughs> <laughs> okay, this is a, obviously a wonderful seduction scene. But this is the scene that most clearly resonates with. So it's, it's often rumored that the model for Ninochka was actually Alexandra Kolontai. And it's actually in this scene where you see that most clearly. Um, Alexandra Kolontai was a great Bolshevik feminist and a great I think, female leader in the way of the Bolshevik Revolution and a kind of extraordinary character. And also a thinker of uh, love and sexuality. So it's in this scene in particular that we see sort of Kolontai's ideas incorporated into the film, except that the film gets it completely wrong. So what we, we have is a kind of portrait of this cold, Soviet, uh, no-nonsense, materialist sexuality without any illusions. And in fact, um, Kolontai was often attributed this one phrase to her that you should, you know, you should make love, you should make love to somebody like you were drinking a glass of water. This is something that Lenin discusses, so in his in his um, exchange with Clara Zetkin, and he actually says this line is driving the youth insane. And actually, uh, Jean-Paul Sartre picks this up as the kind of the wrong theory of sexuality. Uh, Kolontai never said this, and in fact, she doesn't have this kind of utterly desublimated chemical understanding of sexuality. She was actually uh, very much involved with trying to reimagine how sexual amorous relations um, could, could take place in a completely changed social context in a com in, under communism. So I want to now just say a few things about Alexander Kolontai. Um, maybe just as an introduction. Um, again, she was born in 1872 and died in 52, so she survived all the purges. She meets Lenin in 1914, and while well, they were both in exile, so in Europe, and she became really Lenin's, one of Lenin's closest confidants. Um, and she also was like Lenin's emissary to the US. So she did a kind of whole tour through the US and gave many lectures. Um, in fact, if you think, it, the academics here, if you think you have a tough life, she gave 123 lectures in 18 weeks, um, crossing the US speaking about socialism. Uh, it was Kolontai who took Lenin's letters to Pravda in March, April, um, 1917. The, the letters that were famously uh, uh, censored by, by Stalin, um, um, among others, in the editorial board, uh, th which became his April thesis. So he actually entrusted her with these very important documents. Um, she was the commissar of, of, of the, uh, she was the commissar of social welfare. Sorry, I actually have this <laughs> wonderful image of, um, this is the um, Council of the People's Commissars in January 1918 at the Smolny Institute. And there in the center, you see Lenin and Kolontai next to each other, but leaning apart from each other. Uh, and behind her is actually, that's Stalin covering up his face. And, and next to Stalin is uh, Pavel uh, Dibenko, who is uh, Kolontai's husband. So. Lenin and Kolontai. Uh, so she was the Commissar of Social Welfare. I was mentioning this in the bus to some friends on the way. That she actually tried to commandeer the Alexander Nevsky church. So she brought like a group of soldiers to take over the church to turn it into, I believe, uh, like either a hospital or, or something for wounded soldiers. They actually killed a priest. The priest wouldn't let them in. Lenin was furious about this because he said it was much too early to attack the church head on. So she was really to the left of Lenin, you can say. Um, later, the, later, their relationship broke down. So she broke with Lenin over the Treaty of Brest-Litovsk. She actually thought that they should turn, uh, she sh they should turn the war into a revolutionary war. Uh, and her final break came with her support of the workers' opposition movement that we've heard about in other lectures in 1921. So she was adamantly um, really a, a supporter and a kind of early critique, a critic of a bureaucracy. 
And that was the famous uh, Congress where they, they passed the um, no factionalism. So that was kind of the end of her career. At that point, she, she distanced herself and she eventually was appointed an ambassador. She was an ambassador in Norway and then in Sweden, kind of lived most of her life abroad. Okay. Uh, how much time do I have? Just to uh, compress the rest? Five. Okay. I would have said, you know, also part of just the, like, part of my interest in, in Kolontai and this research is I'm interested in debates about sexual revolution, but I would like to try to shift the locus of that from the West in the 60s, which still remains kind of the constant uh, reference point to thinking any kind of uh, emancipation of, of desire of sexuality, to actually this early Bolshevik period. And my research here started with Andrei Platonov and the anti-sexus, which are actually we published an issue of uh, Stasis about. And now I'm kind of moving a bit further, and I've got interested in Kolontai's work. Um, I would have liked to have said, well, okay, I, I tell quickly, there was this, there was this joke, in, there was this old kind of Hungarian socialist joke where they would say, uh, you know, the, t the teacher would say, we're going to do sex education today, but I'm not going to teach about relations between men and women, like heterosexuality, because you know about that, and I'm not going to teach about, you know, relations between people of the same gender, homosexuality, because you know about that too. I'm going to talk to you about a, a brand new and truly unique form of love, the um, sexual relation between the Soviet Union and Hungary. So this is like this is kind of a classic like joke about really existing socialism. But the the kind of okay, it's not just that like Soviet Union is screwing Hungary. But the the kernel of truth is that actually the Soviet sort of father figure often acted as the kind of enabler of sexual relations in a very kind of psychoanalytic way. That the that the paternal character was not the block or the obstacle, but actually the enabler. And there's a wonderful kind of visual detail in the film that you see that they're going in for the kiss and who's between them. <laughs> That's right, Lenin. OK, going on. Uh, I wanted also, I have another anecdote. I'm sorry, I'm, I, I can't resist uh, reading this. This is a, also tr just trying to think what communist eros could be, or kind of a different form of desire. There's this wonderful story that I found in Svetlana Alexeyevich's Secondhand Time, and it goes like this. In the 10th grade, I had an affair. He lived in Moscow. I went to see him, and we only had three days. In the morning at the station, we picked up a mimeographed copy of Mandelstam's memoirs, which everybody was reading at the time. We had to return the book the next day at four in the morning, so hand it off to somebody on a train that was passing through town. So for 24 hours, we read without stopping. We only went out once to get milk and a loaf of bread. We even forgot to kiss. We just handed the pages to one another. All of this happened in some kind of fever or a stupor, all because you're holding this particular book in your hands, because you're reading it. 24 hours later, we ran through an empty city back to the train station, Public transport wasn't even running yet. I remember the city that night, walking together with the book in my purse. We handled it like a secret weapon. That's how ardently we believed that the word could change the world. And in fact, now, there's many things that could be said about this little anecdote. Um, on the one hand, it's tempting to read it simply as a beautiful vignette of what communist desire could be. Um, that this love of this couple is mediated by a third element, by some kind of common cause. But even beyond that, you could say what's important here is that the love is mediated by language and the extreme importance put on the symbolic dimension of experience. That the word has a real transformative power. Within the bourgeois context, it's probably maybe not only psychoanalysis, but that psychoanalysis is certainly a privileged example of a practice which really believes in the transformative power of words within a bourgeois context. So this is very interesting. So not just so two people united by a third thing, but by their faith in the power of language, by the symbolic dimension. And here, with my last couple minutes, I'll just quickly summarize what I got very interested in in Kolontai. So I'm only referring to one text called Love and the New Morality from 1919. And that text is actually mostly a book review of a Viennese uh, feminist uh, author, uh, Greta uh, Meisel Hess, and her book, uh, her book called The Sexual Crisis, A Critique of Our Sex Life from 1909. And what both of these authors, so Kolontai and Meisel Hess, forward as a possible candidate for a kind of revolutionary change or new kind of eros in our era is what they call game love, game love, kind of playing at love. 
I think this notion is very problematic and it's not really well worked out. So by Kolontai, but I think there's many, there's something we could do with that. There's something interesting in this notion of game love. I still have one minute. One minute. Wonderful. Ah, I didn't even get to my, my dear comrade, uh, uh, Nikolai Olenikov. I wanted to mention on this idea of this sexuality, this convergence of sexuality and the symbolic. Maybe I'll just end with him. And this convergence of sexuality and the kind of symbolic. I think um, Nikolai has really uh, produced a kind of very striking image. Let me just read so the English translation of the quote. He says, Still sleepy, I sat down on the toilet. Then it was like an electric shock hit me. No fucking way. I heard my own thought and then paused. You couldn't put it any better. No fucking way, yeah. In the place where my cock should be, there was an ear. <laughs> And ear, the better to hear things with. That's what I think. And there's a kind of fascinating transformation of a kind of castration, invagination, autification. The idea that there's a kind of one listens with one's genital in a way. That the symbolic dimension even penetrates to somehow the most brutal, naturalistic, if you want, aspect of our lives. That a truly, okay, maybe I can say that, a, a truly materialist concept of love is not a concept of love that would say, beneath love, there's simply the bodily drives or sexual satisfaction, and we know everything else is somehow a superstructure to that base. But a really materialistic theory of love starts with love as a symbolic expression, and the fact that we don't know what satisfaction is, that satisfaction is dependent on our practices, the way we speak and how we live, so that an intervention on that level can actually change and have a real corporeal change in how we live satisfaction. If I was to go further, which I won't, I would have talked a little bit more about what's at stake in game love, but I'm happy to turn okay. over the okay. microphone okay. to Julius. One, uh, uh, in addition to the aspects of um, kind of uh, sexual energies that Aaron has talked about, another uh, immense aspect of the um, emancipatory energy of the Bolsheviks involved um, production of new social relations that we can think about or see in the figure of the comrade. And so what I want to do today is um, focus on this figure of the comrade, not getting inspiration from the Bolsheviks, but trying to broaden it, broaden it and see it in other places. So I'll present then four provisional theses on the comrade. Thesis one. Comrade names a relation characterized by sameness, equality, and solidarity. For communists, this sameness, equality, and solidarity is utopian, cutting through the determinations of capitalist society. So in, in, in history of political ideas, uh, political theorists have, they have uh, worked on all sorts of different figures of political relation. Right, they've um, looked at the prince, right? They've understood obligations and duties in terms of the figure of the prince, or in terms of the king, um, monarch, tyrant, dictator. Political theorists have tried to understand political relations in terms of figures like the citizen and the foreigner, the neighbor and the stranger, lord and vassal, friend and enemy. Political theorists have thought about the uh, political relations in and around the household, master and slave, husband and wife, parent and child, sister and brother. They also include the workplace, schoolmaster, pupil, bourgeois, proletarian. Yet even with all of these different figurations of power, its generation, exercise, and limits, there is no account of the comrade. The comrade does not appear. Now, there's an exception, of course, um, with Alexandra Kollontai. She gives us an, a more, uh, an account that's more evocative than analytical. Um, she, and I think that this nice evocative account from Kollontai provides an affective opening into the utopian promise of comradeship. In her writings on prostitution, sex, and the family from the early years of the Bolshevik Revolution, Kollontai presents comradeship and solidarity as sensibilities necessary for building a communist society. She associates comradeship with a feeling of belongingness, a relation among free and equal communist workers. Quote, 
In place of the individual and egoistic family, a great universal family of workers will develop in which all the workers, men and women, will above all be comrades. Comrade then points to a mode of belonging opposed to the isolation, hierarchy, and oppression of bourgeois forms of relation, particularly those in the family under capitalism. It's a mode characterized by equality, solidarity, and respect. Collectivity replaces egoism and self-assertion. Maxim Gorky gives us a similar image of the comrade. And here I'm indebted to my comrade Alexei for giving me this short story um, from Gorky. The, the story was published in English in 1906 in a, a magazine um, called The Social Democrat, and it's entitled Comrade. And the story testifies to the transformative, life-giving power of the word comrade. Gorky presents comrade as a word that, quote, had come to unite the whole world to lift all men up the summits of liberty and bind with new ties, the strong ties of mutual res respect, end quote. Now, the story depicts a dismal, torturous city. It's a city of hostility, violence, humiliation, and rage. In this city, the weak submit to the dominance of the strong. It, there's miserable suffering, and then, in the midst of all the suffering, one word rings out, comrade, and the people cease to be slaves. They refuse to submit, they become conscious of their strength, and they recognize that they themselves are the force of life. In the story, when people say comrade, they change the world. His examples are so great, they include the prostitute who feels a hand on her shoulder and then weeps with joy as she turns around and hears the word comrade. With this word, she's interpolated not as a self-commodifying object to be enjoyed by another, but as an equal in common struggle against the very conditions requiring her commodification. His additional examples are a beggar, a coachman, and, a young, and young combatants. For all of them, comrade shines like a star that guides them to the future. So like common time, Gorky associates the word comrade with freedom from servitude and oppression with equality. And, like her, he presents the comrade as opposed to capitalist egoism's exploitation, hierarchy, competition, and misery. Finally, like Colin Ty, Gorky links comradeship to a struggle for and vision of a future in which we will all be comrades. Now, there's similar romantic celebrations of the relations between comrades um, in the United States um, before the Bolshevik Revolution and around the turn of the century. There was a journal called The Comrade, which was published between 1901 and 1905. It was an um, illustrated monthly publication um, targeted toward ethically minded middle class socialists. And the journal featured poems, short fiction, articles on industry and the conditions of the working classes, translations from European socialists, and autobiographical, autobiographical essays of the sort, How I Became a Socialist. Inspired in part by the poet Walt Whitman's manly love of comrades, the journal echoes Whitman's homoeroticism, homosociality, and celebratory queerness. Comrade relations are relations of a new type, relations that disrupt the confines of the family and heteropatriarchy. The short story, A Slave of a Slave, is a great example. The protagonist is a tomboy, a, a, a girl who dresses and acts like a boy, and then she tries to save a poor woman from her brutal husband, but fails to do so, but nevertheless, in the story ends with her being happy that, well, I'll know that she herself will never be a woman. She's a comrade. The queerness of comrade reappears today in contemporary Chinese, where the term comrade, tongji, is also used for, um, as to mean gay. So this journal, American Journal of the Comrade, featured poems extolling the comrade and comradeship. There was one called A Song of Tomorrow that dreamed of comrade love that would fill the world. Another one evoked comrade bees. And yet another one turned comrade into a prefix. Comrade day, comrade home, comrade march, comrade future, comrade stars. 
And I, um, I guess and everybody here is familiar with um, Rodchenko's expansion of the field of comradeship still further because he includes comrade objects, comrade things. Right? In 1925, Alexander Rodchenko writes, our things in our hands must be also equals, also comrades. So these examples then from Bolsheviks and this um, American turn of the century journal link comradeship to a future characterized by equality and belonging, by a love and respect between equals that is so great that it can't be contained in human relations, but spans to include insects and galaxies, with bees and stars, and objects themselves. Comrade marks the division between the world of misery we have and the egalitarian communist world that will be. Okay, well, what about today, right? right? Like our world, our societies are ever more nationalist and authoritarian, increasingly competitive, unequal, immiserated. As we uh, heard from Sammy, um, we live in a world of a kind of anthropocenic exhaustion, right, where it's hard to recapture the hope, futurity, and sense of shared struggle, part of an earlier revolutionary tradition. So what is comradeship for us? My wager in this project is that a speculative, compositive account of comradeship, one that distills common elements out of the use of comrade as a mode of address, figure of belonging, and container of shared expectations, that such a vision of comrade can help provide us with a view of political relation necessary for the present. Right, comrades are more than survivors, they're more than allies. They are those on the same side of a struggle for an emancipatory, egalitarian world. So, who is the comrade? To find out this, we're going to um, turn to the clip, but not quite yet. Um, and this example comes from another comrade of mine, um, Oksana Timofeva, who, this, as we'll see, this formulation of the thesis two. I got from Oksana, where thesis two, anyone but not everyone can be a comrade. And this um, illustration from Nienichka will open up the point. So the thesis, anyone but not everyone can be a comrade. Right. Okay. okay, let's hope. Let's see if magically this works. It works. Yes. relation, 
but one premised on division and struggle. There is an enemy. But unlike Schmidt's classic account of the political, in terms of the intensity of the antagonism between friend and enemy, comradeship's not about the enemy. The fact of the enemy, of the struggle, is the condition or setting of comradeship, but it does not determine the relation between comrades. Comrades are those on the same side of the division. With respect to this division, they're all the same. Their sameness is that of those who are on the same side. To say comrade is to announce a belonging and the sameness that comes from being on the same side. I can make this clearer by comparing um, the comrade with another set of relations. Um, once we start thinking about it, we recognize that comrade as a term of address and a kind of designation of relationship appears in a lot of different settings, right, besides those of the Communist or Socialist Party, right? It appears in relationship um, between soldiers and the military. It's a term sometimes used among schoolmates. And it's a term used in other radical left collectives. So how then can we start to specify what it looks like? I'm going to now make these distinctions. First, the relation between comrades is not a kinship relation. It's not the same as relations between brothers and sisters, parents, children, spouses, cousins. Right? Your cousin might be your comrade. But when you add the word comrade, you're saying something else designating an aspect of your, of your relationship that cousin doesn't tell you, doesn't, doesn't designate, right? Comrade adds a political element, highlighting the, highlighting the fact that you're on the same side of a political struggle. You share a politics that exceeds your kinship or blood relation, right? Kin disagree, right? Kin often fight politically with each other. We can be related by blood without sharing a politics. Next, the comrade is not the neighbor. Living near someone does not make them your comrade. We can be part of the same locality, the same community, tribe, or neighborhood without being comrades. So comradeship does not designate a spatial relation or an obligation stemming from proximity or shared sociality. Third, the comrade is not the citizen. Citizenship is a relation mediated by the state. Comradeship exceeds the state. It does not take the state as its frame of reference. You can find comrades all over the world. Like that US journal I mentioned, The Comrade. It is interesting on this score as it collects letters, speeches, articles, and all sorts of writing from European socialists. And the, the US is not part of any international at that point but they emphasize and affiliate with an international political movement. Comrades' <laughs> rupture of citizen also manifests when we note the state fear, particularly now in the US, when we note the state fear of communists as traitors, as those with loyalties to an organization other than the state. In the US, during the Cold War, and still today in right-wing rhetoric, comrade is used in a derogatory way to accentuate the dangerous otherness of, communi of communists. Right? Comrades may oppose other citizens. Finally, the relation between comrades is not the same as the relation between friends. We learned from Aristotle's Nicomachean Ethics that friendship is a direct relation between two people for the benefit of each other. It's a relation anchored by, yeah, um, yeah, it's a relation that anchored in the person, um, one that strives for the excellence of the individual. In contrast, comradeship is broad, ease, and stars. Someone previously unknown revealed as a comrade. Comradeship extends through intimate relations to stretch into relations with those we don't know personally at all. Anyone can be a comrade, whether they like me or not, whether they are like me or not. This distinction between the comrade and the friend points to the inhuman dimension of the comrade. Comradeship has nothing to do with the person or personality in its specificity. It's generic. Comradeship abstracts from the, specific, from the specifics of individual lives. 
It abstracts from the uniqueness of lived experience. It concerns rather the sameness that comes from fighting on the same side in a political struggle. In this sense, the comrade is liberated from the determinations of specificity, freed by the common political horizon. The historian Ellen Schrecker makes this point in her magisterial account of anti-communism in the United States. During the McCarthy period of communist persecution, there was a common assumption that all communists were the same. Communists were depicted as puppets, cogs, automatons, robots, even slaves. In the words of one of the McCarthy era's key professional witnesses, people who became communists were, quote, no longer individuals but robots. They were chained in an intellectual and moral slavery that was far worse than any prison, end quote. The truth underlying the hyperbolic claims of anti-communists is the genericity, right, the generic nature of the comrade, of comradeship as a disciplined and disciplining relation that exceeds personal interests. Comradeship isn't personal, it's political. The third thesis, the individual as a locus of identity is the other of the comrade. So comradeship is not a relation of identity. As we see in Nienichka, an issue should not be made of the comrade's womanhood. They all have work to do. So comrade doesn't specify her identity in any way. Um, on the left, we often use um, comrade as a term of address, but we attach it to proper names. Right in here, like comrade Yashikova. Um, the proper name carries the individual identity. The term of address asserts a sameness. The comrade takes the place of hierarchizing terms like sir, madam, or citizen. Now, Oksana emphasizes that in comradeship, identity vanishes. She gives the example of the masquerade used by Bolsheviks undercover. Anyone could be under that mustache. The historian Ellen Schrecker, I mentioned, provides another example, a statement from a general who uh, served under Dwight Eisenhower, and he was really suspicious of communists because, in his words, it's almost impossible to spot them since they no longer use membership cards or other written documents which will identify them for what they are. In these examples, it's the generic comrade who appears, carried by an individual person, yes, but the one that appears is one among many. It could be anyone. Shrekker quotes an undercover informer, quote, anyone can be a communist. Anyone can suddenly appear as a communist party member, close friend, brother, employee, or even employer, leading citizen, trusted public servant. Brecht's um, cantata, you know, Dimasnama, The Measures Taken, similarly explores the antithetical relation between individual identity and comrade. You recall that the um, play has four agitators who are on trial before a party central committee, the control chorus, and they're on trial for the murder of their young comrade. The agitators describe how they went undercover in order to reach Chinese workers that they were trying to organize. Each agitator had to efface their identity to be, quote, nameless and without a past, empty pages on which the revolution may write its instructions. Each agitator, including the young comrade, agreed to fight for communism and be themselves no longer. They all put on Chinese masks, appearing as Chinese rather than as German and Russian. Repeatedly, though, the young comrade substitutes his judgment for that of the party encouraging action before the time is right. He can see with his own two eyes that, quote, misery cannot wait. So he tears up the party writings. He tears up and off his mask. He substitutes his judgment for the parties, thereby exposing them all. Now fleeing the Chinese authorities, the agitators and the young comrade all race to escape the city. Yet they realize that since the young comrade has been exposed, he's now identifiable, and so they have to kill him. The young comrade agrees. They shoot him, throw him into a mine pit that will burn away all traces of him, and return to their work. Comrades are multiple, 
replaceable, fungible. They are elements in collectives, even collections. School children may refer to each other as comrades. In several Romance languages, comrade originates as a term for those who travel together, who share a room, or enjoy doing something together. To be a comrade is to share a sameness with another with respect to where both are going. For anti-communists, the instrumentalism of comrade relations appears horrifying. Combined with the machinic impersonality and fungibility of comrades, the fact that relations between comrades are produced for an exterior purpose, that these relations are means rather than things in themselves seems morally objectionable. But this objection fails to acknowledge the specificity of comradeship as a political relation, being on the same side of struggle. It omits the way that political work focuses on ends beyond the individual, and so necessarily requires collective coordination. And it contracts and constrains the space of meaning into self-relations, as if the abstracted generic relations among those faithful to a political truth could only be the result of manipulation. In an interview with uh, the American writer Vivian Gornick, a former member of CPUSA described the life of meetings, May Day parades, and actions selling the paper and endlessly discussing Marx and Lenin. And the member says, it's, it was beyond good and bad. It was sweeping, powerful, and intense, absorbing, filled with a kind of comradeship I never expect again to know. He was useful, living in the service of a struggle of world historical significance. Fourth thesis. The relation between comrades is mediated by fidelity to a truth. Practices of comradeship materialize this fidelity, building its truth into the world. In his writings, Marx used comrade to designate those in the same political party, and those sharing the same politics. And for him, party referred not just to a formal organization, but to a broader political movement. In his well-known in his well-known letter to Kugelman on the Paris Commune, Marx praises our heroic party comrades in Paris. The communards were not Marx's comrades in a specific party, but in the party understood in a broad historical sense. They were all on the same side, that of real people's revolution. In a text for the International Working Man's Association written in 1866, Mark drew out this political dimension of comrade. Quote, it is one of the great purposes of the association to make the workmen of different countries not only feel but act as brethren and comrades in the army of emancipation. More than union brothers involved in local and national struggles, members of the IWA would be comrades in political struggle fighting on the same side, the side of their class in the struggle of labor against capital. As comrades in an army of emancipation, they would combine and generalize their efforts. No longer would the differences between foreign and domestic workers be able to be used against them. As comrades, they were all the same. The idea that comrades are those fighting on the same side of a political struggle opens up then into this fourth, fourth thesis. The same side points to the truth comrades are faithful to, the political truth that unites them. Fighting index the practice, indexes the practices through which comrades enact their fidelity and work to materialize truth in the world. So comrades demonstrate fidelity through political work through radical action and militant engagement. This practical political work extends the truth of the emancipatory egalitarian struggle of the oppressed into the world, holding open the gap it inscribes in its setting and building a new body of truth. In the socialist and communist traditions, this body has been the party, understood in both its historical and formal sense. So I conclude. Comrade is more than a term of address. It's a carrier of expectations for action, the kinds of expectations that those on the same side have of each other, 
expectations that should be understood via Badiou as the discipline of the event. As Kalantai affirms, the primary virtue of comrades is solidarity. Fidelity is demonstrated through reliable, consistent, practical action. Differences between parties often turn on what comrades can expect of each other, on what it means to be a comrade. Broadly speaking, comrades in most revolutionary socialist and communist parties are expected to engage in the struggles of the oppressed, organize for revolution, and maintain a certain unity of action. Absent expectations of solidarity, comrade as a term of address is an empty signifier. Rather than figuring the political relation mediated by the truth of communism, it becomes an ironic or nostalgic gesture to past utopian hope. The four theses that I've presented together articulate a generic political um, identity or framework, right, a position, a generic political um, site activated through divisive fidelity to the emancipatory egalitarian struggle for communism. A comrade is one of many fighting on the same side. Hello everyone, uh, glad to see you. Uh, recently uh, I found one stupid idiotic uh, news in this yellow press in the style of the 90s. Uh, where uh, they were saying that one of Lenin's ancestors was, was a witch who was persecuted by the Inquisition uh, in the medieval age. Uh, so who is the witch? Uh, this is the one who makes miracles professionally. Uh, and uh, what if uh, this? Uh, what, if, what if it is from this this person that Lenin inherited? He strong belief uh, in a miracle. Lenin and miracles. Uh, so uh, this, I would just show some images of this kind. Uh, Lenin and miracles. He says, uh, in different places, there are no miracles, uh, I quote, uh, there are no miracles in Oh, where are the people? Where are the comrades? Oh. We're watching. Okay. There are no miracles uh, in nature or history, but every abrupt turn in history, uh, and this applies to every revolution, presents such a wealth of content, unfold such unexpected and specific combinations of forms of struggle and alignment of forces of the contestants, that uh, to the lay mind, there is much that must must appear miraculous. Another point. In certain respects, uh, a revolution is a miracle. Another point. Revolutions are the locomotives of history, said Marx. Revolutions are the festivals of the oppressed and the exploited. At no other time there are, uh, uh, are the masses of the people in a position to come forward so actively as creators of a new social order uh, as, as at the time of revolution. At such times, the people are capable of performing miracles if judged by the narrow Philistine scale of gradual progress. And there are a lot of uh, uh, things like that in, in Bain, so he believes in a miracle. Uh, as Roland Boer um, comments on this, above all, Lenin's overt uh, usage of miracle lays its emphasis on human energy, effort, and enthusiasm. Yet it requires st um, stupendous moments for such miracles to occur, moments that evoke super, uh, superhuman effort from those who did know they could do such. Super, uh, superhuman effort. I emphasize here, and I quote uh, from the day before yesterday, I quote uh, Comrade Marina Simakova, who said that Revolution is a human effort, uh, and I would paraphrase here Comrade Selenin and Simakova and say that um, revolution is an inhuman, uh, inhuman, or is a non-human effort, uh, which of course renders the world uh, uh, utterly miraculous. Socialist utopia refers to a miraculous world. Uh, remember Fourier, for example, who 
uh, who was talking about this anti whales and anti uh, anti crocodiles uh, 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 of the future of uh, socialist uh, society, uh, so that animals will transform the the, the, the predatory animals will transform to good ones, uh, kind ones, and so on and so forth. Um, so the nature will be kind to us in Platonov, uh, in Andrei Platonov's terms, the, uh, which is, uh, as Platonov says, the matter of a communist technology, uh, which, is a, uh, which is again a practice as well as magic. Uh, for uh, Roland Moore, uh, the key notion of Lenin's equation of revolution and miracle is the tension between organization and spontaneity, between the so-called party avant-garde and the spontaneity of the people, or, or, or masses, understood as a substance uh, that historically becomes subject. Organization and spontaneity are the two terms of a di dialectical opposition, and what appears miraculous is their synthesis. Uh, this is uh, partly a reply to um, Anton's uh, question uh, raised today at the previous uh, panel uh, about um, the problem between magic, magical transformation and dialectic, uh, dialectical process. Here, dialectics uh, lies in the, the dialectics of a materialist dialectics of a miracle lies in the synthesis of subject and sub substance. Of course, this is a miraculous uh, uh, thing. Uh, um, synthesis focusing uh, especially on the non-human aspects of revolutionary effort. I will consider these two terms in a very specific shape, shape as two specific forms uh, of struggles and alignment of forces: uh, witchcraft and solidarity. So, witchcraft, witchcraft. Um, <laughs> uh, this is uh, Margarita from Bukavos novel, um, Master and Margarita. Uh, why does one become a magician, a witch or a sorcerer? A little child suddenly wants to become a magician at the moment when the world that was first so loving and imminent ceases to immediately obey all his needs and starts to live in a life, a life of its own. When her mom, who was just reading a fairy ta uh, tale aloud, goes out uh, for work and studying alone in her cradle, uh, staying alone in her cradle, so lonely the child <coughs> helplessly waves her hands without being able to change anything. When it turns out that the world of adults, adults is ruled by law indifferent towards the desire of the child, but the desire of the child ceases to be the one and only law of the world of adults. Uh, this trauma of the early childhood, a rupture between the world and the subject, gets even deeper due to understanding that something goes wrong, either with the world or with the subject, and everyone has its own way to deal with it. Religion helps to make oneself conform to the world and to place desire under the law. Magic, in contrast, invites to make the world conform uh, one's desire and to place the law uh, under its uh, desires arbitrary rules. Therefore, our, our, our culture knows at least two, type, two types of spiritual practices. One child who limits oneself with a dream to meet oneself, uh, a, kind of, uh, a kind of magician, becomes religious, establishes a, uh, a relation of gift with God, and becomes his slave, so that God could fulfill her wishes. Another child who wants to become a magician herself becomes a magician, establishes a relation of exchange with the devil, uh, and gives him uh, the soul or renders him another service in, in order to be master of things and to fulfill her desires herself. The one becomes a magician who is ready to make an, an, inhu an, an unhuman effort in order to bring the world to conformity with her desires. One becomes a magician out of injury, resentment, weakness, despair, melancholy, envy, jealousy, loneliness, and irreversibility of death. But one also becomes a magician out of boredom to avoid be being a Philistine. One becomes a magician who sees that something is fundamentally wrong or that the world is unjust and who thinks that only a miracle can change this order of things. A magician wants to challenge a reality provided 
by God and nature. If the native essential injustice of, uh, injustice of the world, that is, privilege of the rich, of the poor, or over the poor, the strong over the weak, the living over the dead, etc., is a law, she wants to violate this law in order to establish its own. Uh, that's why a magician needs some superpower, uh, superpower, um, and some skills exceeding the ones of an ordinary, of ordinary man, like like a flying, for example, right? Now, um, uh, one has to have enough power and skills to perform a miracle in order to feel, to fulfill one's own or someone else's wish. That, that is to transgress the law, to interrupt the natural order of things, and to break its inertia. They break what was mentioned by, uh, by Susan uh, at the beginning of our conference, a normal life, a normal life. Just like revolutionaries, they work both against God and against uh, nature, where, where at the limit of the possible, the competence of people is exhausted, the witchcraft starts. There are bugs and holes in being in which witches put their own bodies. The uh, witchcraft is forbidden. The very fact of witches' existence uh, uh, so um, uh, the, by the very fact uh, of uh, of its existence, which uh, violates uh, the law, be it natural or social law, that allocates place and time for everyone and everything. Therefore, witches are alien. alien. They partly belong to another world to which this law is not applicable, but they also belong to this world, which they try to change, so that they still depend on its law, uh, on its law that they suspend. Uh, as um, Lenin again used to say, uh, revolutionaries do not have respect towards bourgeois law uh, as they want to abolish this law uh, and to establish a new one instead. I refer to the dictatorship of the proletariat, of course, um, already discussed today um, broadly. If we consider the real world as a unity of things, a which, while being its part, definitely breaks this unity in a freaky way. Uh, on the one hand, she secures this unity as if there were holes in being, and she was filling these holes with her body. On the other, she breaks it, and she is having an, and she, um, and she is having another world whose agency uh, agency she is, or simply nothingness. Uh, therefore, they say that witches do not have a backside. Uh, that's why it is so difficult to hunt them. The moment they turn their back to you, they disappear. No one really knows uh, if, it is, uh, if this is true or not, but the one thing is clear. Uh, the body of the witch is neither male nor female, uh, neither animal nor human, but is absolutely, absolutely queer. She can be any, but the world is always, always intolerant to her. Uh, between something that is that is and something that is not, uh, this is that is nothing. Her body bears within it um, that active part of the non-being that we call desire. Uh, I emphasize um, a peripheral position of a wish, or at the border, in between, uh, in between the two wor worlds, for example, here, for instance. A witch international would create not a central but a peripheral committee uh, as they stay at the border and they are the, the border themselves. I will come back to that. And one more thing, so uh, before I pass to the next part, uh, the, source, the source of the witch's magic force, uh, as I claim, is not love as was claimed by such great magicians as Aleister Crowley or Wilhelm Reich or Jesus Christ, but, uh, but uh, the source of power uh, or energy could be uh, comradeship, comradeship and solidarity. Uh, uh, and uh, I would also remind about George Bataille's uh, short, very short text, when, uh, which he wrote uh, facing the, the fascist threat um, 
It is called the Sorcerer's Apprentice. Um, here, uh, there he says, so he, uh, he's saying that uh, the Sorcerer's Apprentice, the Sorcerer's pupils, uh, students, right, uh, who study sorcerer witchcraft, uh, um, is a group, is a secret society, is a, is a certain secret society who uh, is kind of doomed to failure, um, uh, but uh, they also, he compares them with artists. He says, the sorcerer's apprentice, first of all, does not encounter demands uh, that, they are, uh, they, uh, that are any different from those he would encounter on the difficult road of art. Actually, my talk is not an academic paper, but, uh, but uh, uh, a somewhat difficult role to art. I myself uh, sacrifice, uh, sacrifice a certain mm. academic uh, context uh, or content um, for the sake of uh, the artistic desire. Uh, and uh, this, uh, this is a kind of a short introduction into the movie we will see, into the film we will see uh, tonight. Uh, the, the second part, and in the second part, I will talk about one comrade of mine. Okay, it is called solidarity. So, which part we passed already? In his contribution to the critical dictionary entitled "Wild Beasts," Georges Bataille defines metamorphosis as a violent need identical with all our animal needs. This need belongs to the animal, which is uh, which. Uh, all of us bear within. But I says, there is in every man an animal thus imprisoned, like a daily slave, and there is a gate, and if we open the gate, the animal will rush out, uh, like the slave finding its way to escape. The man falls dead, and the beast acts as a beast with no care for the poetic wonder of the dead man. Thus, Man is seen as a prison of the bureaucratic aspect, end of quote. How not to complement the statement with another famous quote now from Vladimir Mayakovsky's uh, poem, at a tear like a wolf at bureaucracy, at bureaucracy. There is a beast incompatible with bureaucratic affairs and a great deal of effort is made to prevent, a non-human effort is to prevent the advent uh, of human effort, uh, is to prevent that an advent always unexpected of this unruly creature. I, uh, so now I, I pass to the work of my comrade, uh, already mentioned today by uh, Aaron, uh, uh, whose artistic desire is precisely to find the gate, gate similar to one mentioned by Bataille, to show how it opens and to let animals go. Uh, is, it, is it okay if I show? Uh, okay, to let animals go. Um, among numerous objects, there is a, uh, in a, um, there, uh, in a, in a two-room installation in Tito's bunker, uh, is the uh, mountains, uh, in the mountains near Sarajevo, there is a canvas in a modest wooden frame with a big Courbet-like vagina from where a realistic brown bull head with a yellow tag in the year emerges. Uh, Alenikov's animals, uh, and there are some other images from this nice installation, the great, I, I love it so much, I just, uh, th this entire uh, talk is just a, it's just a purpose, um, uh, it's just a pretext to show um, uh, these uh, lovely things. Uh, so, um, Alenica, uh, animals burst out of a human body and penetrate them again in an odd manner. But don't be fooled by their appearance. These are not sexual beasts. These are political beasts. Through the gate of metamorphosis, they rush out from our sexualized bodies uh, where they were imprisoned and begin to speak. What do they speak about? Various things. Most often they are telling their stories. Each story is peculiar and necessarily contains some private, intimate element. I wouldn't, however, like the one with the, with the um, ear instead of penis. Um, I wouldn't, however, call them personal. Rather, these are impersonal or even unpersonal stories. A person's face 
uh, is replaced with an animal's head, with a flower, with something or someone else. It is important uh, to understand that these Olenikov's metamorphoses are not infinite becomings uh, devoid of any sense, anything transforms into anything. They, they do not partake in the capitalist process of overproduction of creative knowledges and multiplying differences. There is something that, uh, through the whole chain of transformation, remains the same. Uh, this something does not have to deal, however, with the inner self or personality of any kind, but only, as Alenikov's penis here claims, the pain of solidarity. Solidarity means sharing pain, but one cannot share pain without penetration. Those who share pain interpenetrate. Their mouth, their arms, their ears all become kids, all become kids. Uh, it is the pain of solidarity which makes animals come out and speak. They speak almost like those in fables and fairy tales, miraculously, but this is the materialist miracle of comradeship. Uh, and here I continue Judy, uh, with Jody's, um, Jody's line, um, the solidarity uh, and comradeship, these are the forms of relation in the enti of the entities that experience metamorphosis or catastrophic transformations depicted by Olenka. Friendship, love, sisterhood and other nice things could be there too, mm -hmm. but these things uh, as we know them, normally attach us to a singular individual, as Jody already said, who has name, face, and something which cannot be replaced. A friend or a beloved one is pinned down by their identity. In comradeship, identity vanishes. I also quote myself. <laughs> think, about, think about the Russian Bolshevik revolutionaries in the underground. For the sake of conspiracy, they live <laughs> faked social life under different names, constantly, constantly changing their passport, families, uh, or even gender. What acts here is a mask beyond which there is no real face, but only a pain to be shared. Comrades are replaceable. They wear false names uh, and false mustaches. This aspect of the masquerade makes politics a theater, a theater, but a very a special one like Artaud's uh, theater of cruelty uh, here, ancient ma masks are bare as they present a show, a ritual uh, of a direct uh, and instant communication, like a plague, a contagion. The void beyond the mask can be that uh, contagion, or in our words, sharing of the pain, not symbolically as between sisters, but bodily. Uh, comrade is the one on whose neck you can put your head, to whom you can give one of your hands if she has none at the decisive moment when the enemy attacks. Friendship and love wouldn't sustain such a disturbing, disturbing act. They are too innocent, too kind for that, too human. Comradeship transcends the borders of humanity towards an impersonal multiplicity where there is no one. What does uh, this no one mean? A structural possibility for the one to be. A comrade is never alone, not in the trivial sense that there is always somewhere else around who does not let her feel alone. No, being never alone in a more radical sense mean, means that you are always among others, uh, like to borrow a Deleuzean and Guattarian um, definition, a wolf, a wolf in a pack. Uh, I quote, you can't be one wolf, you're always eight or nine, six or seven, nor six or seven wolves all by yourself, all at once, but one wolf among others with five or six others. A pack uh, is not a gathering of individual uh, beasts taken one by one. The irredu irreducible multiplicity here means every animal is a pack uh, among, among uh, uh, among its number. Nonetheless, uh, Deleuze and Vatari do have a place for a lone wolf, the one who runs alongside and at the same time a bit apart from the main pack. He can be the leader of the pack or an outcast. Deleuze and Vatari uh, call such an animal which exists in every pack 
an exceptional indiv individual or uh, an anomaly. And here the theme of, uh, the, theme of the periphery or the border takes on a special significance. Um, Uh, significance. Um, the exceptional, uh, uh, the exceptionalness of the individual is determined by its position at the border of what Deleuze and Guattari call pack. Sorcerers uh, or witches, uh, I quote, have always held the anomalous position at the edge of the fields of, or woods at the borderline of the village or between villages where they enter into a secret alliance with various animals and demons. Um, one should not forget about sorcery. Um, metamorphosis that occur at the border of the pack, metamorphosis of, um, of a certain types of animals into others, into monsters. When the gate is opened, the beast is liberated of being one and joins a shareable collective body that hurts. hurts. No one, that is, no person is there but the pain of solidarity, which breaks the continuity of nature for the strangest interspecies alliances. Uh, and here I would show mm -hmm. three more uh, images. Uh, Maybe you won't even believe me, but the story goes like that, says the narrator uh, of Alenica's uh, of this story. But as we see a bull, we tend to believe him, even though he tells us two different stories uh, about one and the same person. We tend to believe the bull because we know that in contrast to men, animals do not lie. That is why they always speak in fables. If you want a truth to be told, uh, let an animal speak. They always tell the truth. This is one of the lessons of psychoanalysis. Thus, Jacques Lacan suggests that animals do not lie because they do not have language and do not have an unconscious, which is structured like a language. <coughs> In a way, this is true, but only when spoken by the animal. But how can it speak if, as it says, it does not have language and therefore an unconscious? For this, I would reply that um, instead of having an unconscious, animals are unconscious itself. To put it bluntly, the unconscious is not the, some deepest inner self, but an animal or an alien, an other that is both outside and within us, one that already speaks, so to say, before any language. On the one hand, it is the animal that rushes out when you open the gate. On the other, it is what the ancients called soul. Uh, if, according to Georges Bataille, an animal is imprisoned within the human, in André Platono, on the contrary, a secret human being is imprisoned in every animal body. It suffers and desires, but cannot uh, express its desire and pain because it does not know how to speak and how to cry. They were, no. uh, so, uh, in uh, one of his essays, uh, Platono, uh, however, calls human soul an obscene animal. He's talking about a communist who has a beast in his hair and whose soul is free from underwear and boots of decency. Uh, it is not the human body that, that, that is obscene in its animality, but the soul, a miraculous beast who starts to, I quote Platonov, a miraculous beast who starts to howl in his hair joyfully and freely. Uh, so, Alenikov metamorphosis combines uh, the, uh, these forms. Say, an animal imprisoned in Bata's bureaucratic man rushes out, but it, uh, it turns out that this animal, thus liberated, is actually Platonov's secret man in his piece, and it is he who now speaks with the animal's mouth. And within, the, um, within that secret man, there is another animal for which yet another gate can be opened, and uh, another deeper secret man uh, that tells its story. Uh, I quote uh, Olenikov. And if you think it's deeper already, here I've got news for you. It ain't to call uh, to, uh, it ain't no coal mine deep enough, it ain't no, no trenches low enough. So we are keeping on, on falling, comrade, says Olenikov, uh, says Olenikov's uh, Minotaur, Minotaur, who lives in the World War II bunker. The bunker inhabited by the Minotaur is compared with the wartime door 
catacombs, underground casemates, coal mine, the grave and the labyrinth. He is not alone there, there are also other heroes. Another underground character is, is that man who was either abandoned in the mountains and then adopted by a family of cows you know, by the names of uh, partisan, um, uh, partisan Voltaire and mother, or was a child of Tita living uh, all his life in a bunker, in a bunker so no, nobody saw him. He was dreaming to find a tunnel that leads to Zurich, directly to Cabaret Voltaire, and that he actually found his tunnel, but it led him to Sarajevo instead. Um, <laughs> Bunker or labyrinth could, uh, could stay as a simple metaphor of the unconscious if it wasn't in addition charged with a strong political meaning of the underground. Both a conspiracy of no name comrades sharing their pain, a secret conspiracy of a sorcerer's uh, apprentices, uh, and the blind work of the mall of history. Uh, and uh, this work, the miracle that happens here, um, during this uh, Moore's work is the one uh, of, uh, of uh, synthesis between this uh, sub uh, substantial, uh, substantial part of solidarity or sharing pain, uh, the subjective part of this witchcraft or transforming, uh, transforming act, uh, and between uh, the, the reason and the unconscious, uh, and between um, um, uh, the uh, witchcraft and solidarity, and, and between uh, spontaneity and uh, um, organization. Organization. Thank you. Thank, thank you. Oh. Uh, okay. So that, uh, thank you very much. I think they still three talks. They had something in common because they addressed transformation, metamorphosis, individuation. I think it could be ground for interesting discussion. Uh, I, if you want to ask a question, I will bring you a microphone. Uh, thank you all the speakers. Um, I have the question uh, to Jody. Um, like two short questions. To what extent uh, we can treat this uh, address, as you said, because in the, in, in, at the end of your talk you said comrade is a vocative, uh, vocative mood, uh, and to what extent we can ontologize something that is a form of address, um, uh, since we already have certain generic uh, concepts. What does it end to the already existing generic uh, concepts? And another thing is what you said about queerness of the comrade, um, because um, uh, this um, generalness of uh, Homo Sovieticus, which was comrade, was always criticized in post-Soviet gender theory as some kind of androgynous uh, creature. So uh, what would be preferable, queerness or androgyny? And do, do we have to differentiate between these? We'll be giving microphone to the order people raising hands. So. Thank you all the speakers for the brilliant presentation. I have uh, some remarks to uh, Aaron about quality, but I guess I'll save time and just share them afterwards. I have a quick question to Asana. Uh, first of all, uh, I have nothing against non-human uh, comrades. Uh, I guess the thing I was saying the other day uh, is actually very close to the question of metamorphosis or transformation that demands certain that it demands human contribution, certain decisiveness uh, to be transformed. But um, my question is about the definition for magic. Uh, I have nothing against magic as well, but I guess magic can be really, really different. This the so-called daily magic which is a pure superstition. Uh, there is uh, black magic. There is, uh, I don't know, there are like uh, this pantheism. And I didn't really understand uh, how you define magic. And I think this is quite important. If I can, I'd like to have quite a general comment uh, 
coordinated after this very important conference. Maybe we have to go in depth in the passage from, uh, let's say, what was to be done to what is to be done now in our present. Um, Jody explained very well who is a comrade. I think that uh, we have also to pose the question of who is uh, a revolutionary militant. Uh, because uh, Lenin, Bogdanov, Bukharin and all the people we quoted in these days uh, were revolutionary militant that manage concepts and bombs. Because uh, concepts and bombs are both specific uh, weapons. So I think that the revolutionary militant is a corporate who put entirely in question is or her life. And here I think that we have to go in the present because I, I'm not talking only on the theoretical point of view, but uh, I'm uh, talking of our lives. Uh, that means uh, um, uh, I think that uh, we have really to, to, to become comrades and revolutionary militants, we have to break the level of acceptation of our present. Uh, in some ways, in, in, the, in the current phase, sometimes we say that there, there is a great feeling among comrades of depression, because there is no much revolutionary process. But I think that the problem is not only depression. The problem is also the satisfaction. Too much, uh, we as comrades are too much satisfied of uh, the self, of ourselves. I think that we have the, to build up the capacity to break this level of uh, acceptation because it's true, there is no uh, a revolutionary phase, but I think the phase in which there are no struggles is the most important phase because we can anticipate what is coming on what is the possibility that he is coming. Uh, 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 so about uh, miracles. In uh, 1962 there was uh, a, a riot in uh, Turin in Piazza Statuto that was uh, symbolic at the beginning of an important uh, cycle of struggles of uh, uh, factory uh, uh, workers. Uh, Forty years uh, later uh, there was an interview by Tu Romano Equati, one of the main of Italian operaismo, and uh, uh, they asked to uh, Romano, uh, uh, did you, as operaista, did you expect it, that uh, riot? And uh, Alquati answered, we didn't expect uh, the riot, but we organized the riot. And I think, uh, really, that's all about what we is in a revolution. Thank you. I have a commentary more about the uh, uh, presentation and then a um, question to Arif and Judy. About Ohana, I wanted to suggest another perspective to understand the relation of uh, witchcraft and formation of Soviet Union, not only on the subjective uh, aspect of symbol, symbols or faiths, but on the objective term of fetishism as the concept appears in On the Capital, since Marx takes the concept from the anthropological rituals of witchcraft, practices that project spirits into things, then the things appear to our eyes to be alive. So, in the context of construction of Soviet Union, uh, can't we understand that witchcraft materially happened in terms of social fetishism? Fetishism of machinery or fetishism planning fetishism of productive labor. That's a point of view. But to Aaron and Jody, I would like I would like to ask to Aaron to go further on the argument about Yugo uh, Vira, about the uh, love game. Since it appeared to be one of the most revolutionary uh, topics of the revolution in terms of women and men and emancipation. That like Kolotaich also described something around the uh, love comradeship. Right. It's also a concept, so if you can present it to us, thank you. So, uh, a question we have time only for two short.
short three questions and then we have the speakers time to respond. Well, then maybe I will, my, my comment to Georgia, I think it's a brilliant research and it's very interesting. And uh, I a bit regret that Platonov is missing. Uh, I think. Yeah, but uh, the comment is about Platonov, uh, that precisely in the novel Happy Moscow you have that uh, uh, negation of uh, personality and identity, including class identity and gender identity throughout the novel. And uh, maybe comradeship in this respect could be linked also uh, to the negation of the past, or of, of, of the class, in a sense. And also perhaps uh, 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 the comradeship uh, uh, brings uh, um, the the, the past also informed, so I think, you know, I don't know, but it was, I, I, I cannot briefly comment on that, but my point is just on, on, on that, that Platonov is very, I think, interesting, important uh, to, to include. I know we're in a hurry, but nevertheless, let us uh, slow it down. Uh, I think uh, I really like the way you three presented uh, uh, in, in a way in a crossover. Mm -hmm. Other than so many panels that we are used uh, to even on this conference, there was a certain comradeship already on the panel, so there is a formal uh, form content uh, relationship. Thank you for that. Um, I, my, my comment goes to um, Jody and, and Oksana, more to, to Jody concerning uh, the question maybe of uh, the relationship um, between uh, humans, animals, and things. Uh, I think that you're uh, in your in your try to put up your four proposals. You're still in in between, and uh, I would like to push you further uh, and with a small criticism of your fourth uh, thesis which is also connected to, to some of Oksana's stuff. Uh, uh, I think that when we're really uh, interested in some kind of uh, non-humanist uh, or uh, overcoming the humanist uh, tradition and thinking about comrade, comrade things also, then we have to also discuss uh, uh, this concept of action that you were using before. Uh, I think it's uh, rather uh, a, a very com complex relationship between activity and pa passivity where the typical idea, and I, of course I, I really appreciate Gigi's uh, uh, call to weapons, but uh, nevertheless it, we, we have to also overcome the individualist uh, aspects of, uh, of this old uh, example, sometimes also masculinist uh, examples. So, uh, my question to you would be rather to develop further this, uh, this aspect of um, uh, comrade things uh, and especially the relationship between things and animals and humans. Sorry, I can't go further to Oksana, but you can hear that there is some kind of question to you also. Okay, thank you very much. So now, no, no everybody now have uh, like three, four minutes to respond, sorry, because it's really a person, but uh, otherwise, yeah. just reach out to yeah. so please, 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 we have a film, right? right? Can we, are we yeah. watching yeah. a film? Yeah. Yeah. It can be very good. Oh, yeah. so it's not difficult. Yeah. Or just start. Um, um, thanks, thanks folks for the different comments. I'll just address um, one or two of them um, really briefly. Um, on the um, androgyny and queerness part from um, Ketty, um, I actually don't think it's a choice. I think that um, one of the things that makes Comrade important and useful and um, a positive development now as a um, term, uh, a political term, is because um, there's so many young people who are rejecting um, specific notions of sexuality and gender and are doing a lot of experimentation and so an androgyny that might have one time be um, a problem can now be an opportunity, a challenge, and the same thing with queerness. So I think that that's, um, that that's a real benefit. And um, on, the, on the militant question, I, my, um, 
thoughts about that were going in the same direction as Gerald. I, I find it like so, such a masculine figure. And it seems like a masculine heroic figure where the heroism comes from the specificity of just how bold a one guy can be. And I think this leads to a kind of adventurism rather than thinking first of, of our politics in terms of the relations we have when we work together and fight together politically on the same side. And so I wanted to um, emphasize relation first, the relation among comrades, rather than the kind of heroism of an individual. It doesn't mean we don't need heroics, it doesn't mean that we don't need sacrifice, but I think that, um, that, that, that there's something about the figure of the militant that carries a lot of, um, of, of masculine baggage that, that we don't really need. Um, there was one more thing on, on comrade relations. Ah, okay. 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 Uh, okay, so you or Let's just come go across. Like, um, okay, let me just say a few things about the, the game love, which I think could be developed in an interesting way. Just three very brief comments. You know, one, one of the things that Kualantai is trying to deal with is that kind of almost eternal question of the relationship between work and love. And she's trying to challenge this kind of classic sort of formulation of that that you found also in communism, uh, that basically uh, a woman should lose herself in a man and a man should lose her, himself in his work, this idea. So how do, you, how do you negotiate the relationship between work and love? And actually there, I would go back to like, you know, the earliest philosophy, this was really posed by Socrates, you know. Um, everybody loves Socrates, but the problem is Socrates only loves philosophy. Like, so Socrates is the first character who chooses his career over his love life, in a way. <laughs> and then you find the ultimate culmination of this, in the male articulation of this, in figures like Kierkegaard and Kafka, where to sacrifice love is a, is a sign of authenticity, of your uh, uh, fidelity to the cause. And in fact, Kolontai wants to, in a way, agrees that like work comes before love. In a way, the logic of that is that it has to be that way. Because if you sacrifice your work for your love, you burden your lover with the guilt of the sacrifice. You lose both, basically. But her question is, can you put work above love and still have love? And that's her, this is what she talks about, free love in this sense. So I think that you could really frame that in an interesting way. The second comment is, you know, when Kolontai talks about love, she's not just talking about love as a one aspect of the revolution, but her comments on love are actually about revolutionary praxis in general, I think. So, like, the one quote I like, she says, when she talks about game love, she says, the problem is, quote, love is either a tragedy that tears the soul apart or it's vulgar vaudeville. Is there some third way? And in a sense, this is also the problem with the revolution. Like, vulgar vaudeville is a kind of bureaucracy. Bureaucracy is a kind of masturbation of politics, in a certain <laughs> sense. That, uh, you know, in the sense that an institution that has a functional aim gets more interested in its kind of self-organization than in actually its mandate. But neither should the revolution end up tearing, tearing apart the very thing it wants to emancipate, which is the tragic love. And the third thing, I guess I just uh, leave. Well, the, the third, very quickly, the problem of property relations in love. How do you transcend the idea that the other is your property? And even if you have a strong sense that you have a, you know, your rights over yourself and you respect the other's rights, you still have this problem, well, does the other, we're still thinking in terms of a property relation. I mean, I think maybe the communist horizon of Eros is that, you know, I don't own you, you're free, but I don't own you because you don't even own yourself. You know, how can we conceive of ourselves not as property of ourselves? I think that would also be a kind of challenge you could articulate by Kolontai. So. Do we still have a minute? Uh, okay. Uh, to uh, first to Marina's uh, question, um, uh, as you say, a human, uh, oh, okay. a human action, maybe, maybe it is what, what I kind of underst uh, understand by, by red magic uh, here. You hmm. said black magic, white magic, um, uh, spiritism, and so on. Uh, and uh, red magic, it's, um, uh, it, uh, mm, it is different from others. Um, first of all, by the fact that it's, uh, it works with the collective desire, not individual desires, but uh, collective desires. Uh, and um, and it, of course, it is a metaphor. It is a metaphor of things like art and science, for example. Uh, but only, not only that. Um, no, it's a long question, so I pass to the, the next one. I just give a, uh, a short, brief uh, suggestions. Uh, 
um, uh, thank you, uh, Gigi, for, uh, uh, Gigi, for this um, uh, comment. Uh, I really liked it about uh, the opera scene we organized, right? Uh, and uh, I actually did want to say that uh, materialist miracle, what I call materialist miracle, is, is not the one that happens, but the one that is made to happen. Um, then the, there was a question about the Soviet experience and witchcraft, and here I refer to uh, the, um, the paper by uh, Oleg Harkordin, who was uh, the day uh, before, uh, who was talking the day before about this uh, Strugatsky's novel, uh, Sunday Begins on Monday, where they were uh, describing this uh, uh, Soviet uh, future, Soviet institution, the institute, the scientific institute, of magic, uh, and uh, it's actually a red magic. Uh, they uh, wanted to, uh, their aim was the, the, um, um, uh, uh, that the miracle uh, becomes, uh, so in this, uh, in this novel, a miracle becomes a matter of a communist science and, and technology. So uh, Karkordian uh, was uh, saying in this regard, about um, the idea of changing the universe instead of uh, making scratches in, in its surface. And that's what he called. Um, OK, um, here I, uh, I stop. Uh, we can continue later. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you very much.